What's up everybody, back with another raid guide and today we're taking a look at Mythic Anduin. I'll be going over most of the new mechanics, how to deal with them as well as some tips and tricks for your progression. I won't be covering all of the heroic mechanics unless they've been updated for Mythic, so if you're not up to date feel free to check out my heroic guides. Now setup wise we went with 2 tanks, 5 healers and 13 DPS. You want at least 1 necro DK, ideally 2 for their grippy hands. And on the topic of grippy hands, if possible you want to bring at least two priests to the party. Mass Dispel for the downstairs adds helps a lot. Other than that, just big blasters really. Just like on Heroic, this fight is a mix of needing bursty single target damage one moment and massive AoE the next. And as far as healers goes, Necrage, Pally, Vent, the Resto Shaman are very good at carrying the add healing. So what is new for the little lion cub? Well, a lot. So I'm sorry in advance for the novel. In phase one and phase two, the first thing out is Blasphemy. On Mythic, Blasphemy is also triggered when a marked and unmarked player cuddles. So nothing is safe and everyone is out to get you. Due to this, you have to play Blasphemy just a tad differently. So we pre-assigned rough spread positions for everyone and when Blasphemy went out, we pre-spread into those locations. And then we always tried to clear with the same 1-2 players around us, as odds are most pulls you'll get different marks and be able to clear with those 1 or 2 players. We also had a rule that if you clear clear in range, you stay in range and go out to the edge, even if you're a melee who ran out, and if you clear in melee, well you collapse on boss. That way you'll get a nice safe path going around boss where unlucky marks can run and meet up. Lastly, for the very first blasphemy, we had non-active tank always be right behind the active boss tank and they always cleared each other. Now if they had the same mark, melee helped them out. So melee needs to not omega Pepega insta clear, but wait half a second to see if you need to help clear the two tanks. The non-active tank can of course also go for a jog and clear in range if needed. Otherwise you could do a more scripted approach to this, where you create three camps of four and then melee and melee healers spread around boss. And within each camp you first look to clear to the person connecting with the green line in the picture or blue line if the green player has the same mark. And the same is true for melee around the boss. And again you clear in melee, stay in melee, clear out in range, stay out in range. And any stragglers just meet up at the side or in front of boss. Most of the times you'll be able to clear within all the small groups but sometimes RNG is an ass and you have to jog around a bit. Regardless the biggest tip for blasphemy I can give is be consistent. Spread in the same way, move to the same location, always try and clear your mark with the same players that you always do. Everything just to make this face more consistent. Lastly, communicate. When there's two or four marks left and things are getting a bit hectic, people have a tendency of panicking a bit. So it helps a ton if someone just calls, run to the left or meet up at X mark. Next out is the King's Mourn face, if you will. When a player gets sent down by standing in the King's Mourn, and they will spawn a severed soul upstairs. Now these souls spam cast banish soul which instantly kills the player that spawned it if it goes off. And when you kill one of these adds the player that spawned it gets sent back up which is now the only way to get players back up. So when team 1 gets sent down the rest of the raid needs to interrupt these souls and slowly nuke them down. You'll need at least 3 ideally 4 AOE interrupts or stuns to keep them from casting before they die. Things like druid in Cap Roar or Demon Hunter AoE stun. Now if you follow the strat I'll be covering in this video, I advise you not to assign a tank as an AoE interrupter due to boss movement. But let's go over DPSing down the severed souls, cause it's a big thing here. Now these needs to be nuked down in a very controlled manner, as you don't want people to come out before they're done with the downstairs adds. So if you all stack boss on adds and just go Omega Papega Blast, you're gonna have a bad time. You can also time it so you come out just a few seconds before or during blasphemy cast which means only half the raid actually needs to do the blasphemy. Now the way we did this was we had like 2 to 3 DPS assigned to bring these adds low. The rest just tunneled boss and the boss was always tanked away from the adds to keep him from getting unevenly cleaved by some classes <coughs> MM hunters and then called for everyone to swap to adds when it was time for the other group to come back out. Now to top this off on the topic of King's Morn, you now get less energy per ad you've cleared. It's now 50 energy per full clear, meaning both groups have to do a full clear. Otherwise the intermission gets uh, a tad tricky. And this is why having access to two necro DKs 
really help out and somewhat carry that face. If you don't have access to 2XDKs, then hopefully you have a lot of knockbacks or very good split cleave. So, for example, my group, cue the awesome picture. We had a priest plus a hunter knock one of them towards us, and our grippy DK grips the other far away ad, and then grippy hands does the rest. You might need to move a little bit back and forth while grippy hands is running, just to make sure they actually do get gripped in. But once they were stacked, we followed up with binding shot to keep him in place, and ring of peace or knocks if we needed to, well, keep him from going in. But there's tons of different ways to do it, and it can differ a lot depending on your raid comp or whatever you find easier. Some people do a lap around the ads with the grippy hands up, some people do like we where we knock him towards one location. Moving on, in phase 2, those pesky grim reflection ads have been beefed up a bit. Anytime you kill a grim reflection, it gives 200% haste to the remaining grim reflections, which of course makes their AoE fear a lot faster. So when you get to the fourth ad, it's like sub one second cast on that bad boy. Now to counter this, you want to weave in some stuns and silences. Now for the first ad, you just interrupt it. The second ad, you can fully interrupt or you can add a silence or a stun if you want to make it easier. The third ad you mostly stun and silence using shorter stuns, and the fourth ad you need to pretty much completely stun and silence, so things like hammer of justice, kidney shot, solar beam, stuff like that. Pro tip, curse of tongues works on them, so having curse of tongues running on the third and the fourth ad helps a lot. Now for the intermission, the new-ish mechanic here is that there's two monstrous soul ads per intermission, like it used to be on heroic before they nerfed that. No big brain play here but we'll touch a bit on this topic later in the video. Lastly, we have Phase 3. Hopelessness has gotten the same treatment as Blasphemy. Unmarked and marked players go boom if they collide. However, when a player with Hopelessness removes their mark on Anduin's barrier, they will shoot out a fragment of hope which fires out towards the edge of the arena and spawns a circle on the ground. If a player with hopelessness soaks this circle, their debuff is removed, and if you fail to soak it at all, the raid takes like 40k damage. And these fragments go out in the same direction as a player enter the barrier, so you can control ish where they're going to land. So due to this, you'll be spreading, clearing, and moving in a very set way during phase 3 to make sure the raid doesn't go boom and you get the clears fast, but we'll go over all of that in just a bit. Wicked Star has also been empowered in phase 3, so when it goes out it will ricochet whenever it reaches the edge of the arena. Again, there's a few ways to deal with this, lots of people use gateways to keep him in the same place, so players targeted by it takes a gateway and then just moves away. We kinda just YOLO'd it and it was super fine. Players with stars moved out and then we just dodged stars if they bounced in towards boss. And yeah, that's all the new things and how to deal with them. So with that said, let's go over some final prep before we break down the fight. First of all, you need to split your raid for the King's Morn Realm, just like on Heroic. Now this all depends on your setup, your DPS, but our approach was to send down just enough DPS so we'd be able to consistently full clear with just a few seconds left, and then getting sent up shortly after that, meaning we also skip Blasphemy for everyone we always sent down. So one of our team had 1 tank, 2 healers, and 4 DPS, next team had the same, but we added 2 extra DPS, so 6 in total. Big math! Each team had a priest and a necro DK for mass dispel and, well, grips. And you also want to keep in mind that as you're setting up these groups, the upstairs team will need 3 to 4 AoE interrupts or stuns for these severed souls. In the end, how many you send down depends on how many you need in order to full clear and how fast you want to full clear. Like I said before, our guild always cleared and got sent back up when there's around 1 to 5 seconds left under debuff, which is around this time Blasphemy goes out upstairs. How However, some guilds have instead sent down extra DPS to full clear faster, blast the soul adds upstairs fast to get their raid team back up sooner. Regardless of your approach, there's gonna be some trial and error here. And before you pull, make sure you've pre-assigned spread positions for blasphemy and practice that spread a few times helps shave off a lot of early death. And make changes early. If your pre-assigned positions need adjusting, might be that you notice after a few pulls that one area gets very crowded, well just move their spread positions. But once you've found a spread that works, stick with it like my childhood trauma stuck with me. So between 1 and 200 pulls, you will wipe a lot to Blasphemy. A lot. Like more than twice at least. But just remember, even if it feels like progress is slow, eventually it will click 
and get a lot more consistent. It's just one of those mechanics where people need to make mistakes and experience the different overlaps. So, let's break down the fight a bit. Cue the picture. Now on pull, we drag boss down towards our green mark, as we want the King's Morn to hit around there. Raid stacks near boss, blast away and deal with the first barrier, just heal forehead. As soon as the barrier is gone, range start moving out and spread for blasphemy. Melee can spread when the starts cast. Now following this, you'll get your first Kingsmorn, I recommend marking your tank and Kingsmorn team stack on that tank, because the souls you spawn when you get slapped spawn near or at you, so you want these to be as stacked as possible to make everything easier for the upstairs team. Now upstairs, you want to instantly move Anduin back towards the purple markers so the severed souls are out of cleave range. This is why you don't want to assign tanks as AoE interrupters for this particular strat. Now have your assigned DPSers AoE down the severed souls and then leave them on low HP. And I recommend assigning one person to track this to keep track of their HP and say stop DPS or more dam etc. Now for the wicked stars, first of all if you get hit by it you'll need to use a consumable or get spam healed and a defensive doesn't hurt. Like no joke, the wicked stars are wicked on mythic. Now it always targets two players at a time so you want them to move out in pairs. First two players go left, next two will go right, then left. This makes it extremely extremely easy to dodge, you always know where they'll be going, and one part of the room never gets super crowded with stars. Now when Anduin is about to cast barrier, you want to turn him so he faces the small adds so the barrier spawns closer to the small adds. So when team 1 comes back up, they're either in or extremely close to the barrier and can help out, as the rest of the raid is busy doing that blasphemy thing and trying not to die. Just don't move Anduin while divine stars are going out, just turn him towards the small adds, drop barrier, stay there. When there's like 2-3 seconds left before Mark goes out, everyone swaps to the souls and finish them off to get team 1 back out. Communication is key here as well, make sure team 1 is done with adds before you pop him out, but the timing you want to go for is 2-3 seconds before marks go out if you plan to skip half of them like we did. Following this, it's pretty much rinse repeat, you play it the same but the overlaps are a bit rougher as you'll get barrier and stars at the same time here. It's very important important that you do the left and right movement with stars as you need to get them out and away from the barrier fast. And this is followed by blasphemy and you want to get team 2 out when they're done with adds during or after blasphemy, same as team 1. Now as soon as blasphemy is done, drag boss down to the barrier if there's any left and then it's time for intermission. So a few things for the first intermission, you want a few range DPS to always be a bit away from the raid to bait jumps and puddles away from the rest of the raid. Boomkins, warlocks, they're great for this. You can also bop them if they get too many stacks. Next out, assign one person to call out where to go when walls spawn. For us, we went with one of the tanks, and he just said either move left or move right. Now these walls can only spawn two per direction if you will, so if a wall has spawned behind you and in front of you, you can move boss there and you won't get any new walls from that particular ledge. Other walls can still overlap, but you won't get one spawning on top of you. But most of the time, that kind of minimaxing if you will isn't needed, it's more important to just pick a direction and move. Which is why we also had the rule, fast calls is better. Sometimes it would have been better to move to the right, but it's better to move left fast than last second to the right, if that makes sense. But the biggest thing here are the monstrous souls, as you'll get one per army of the dead, so two in total. These have a lot of health and needs to be your main priority whenever they're about to start casting their self-destruct. So we assigned one to two DPS to keep an extra extra eye on each set of monstrous soul. First one you'll have bloodlust and a lot of cooldowns running, so it shouldn't really need too much more than everyone swapping to its sub 50%. Second one however is the tricky one as you'll have virtually no cooldowns and bloodlust, so having one or two players save cooldowns or save some burst for this one is pretty much mandatory. For example, we had a Venther Boomkin finish his ramp into it sub 50%, which pretty much made it go boom. Regardless, make sure you assign damage to them and everyone swaps to them sub 50% tanks, healers included. Lastly, make sure you finish all the small adds before the intermission ends, as you lose your damage reduction and damage increase, meaning they slap hard.
hard and they take a long time to kill. So pat away! And once intermission ends, it's time for phase two. So let's talk Grim Reflections a bit more. Cue the picture! So you'll always get four fear adds, and we always kill green first, then star, purple, and lastly circle. First add, like I mentioned earlier, we just YOLO interrupt. Second, we use priest stun into priest silence into interrupt if needed. Third add, hunter stun, demon hunter stun, paladin ashbringer stun, interrupt, or silence. And last add was cyclone into hammer of justice into solar beam. And remember, curse of tongue on the third and fourth add. So at the start of phase two, we drag boss in front of green mark fear add and we CC the other three adds. Full nuke on green marked add, boss damage does not matter, the damage you do in phase one and phase two is pretty much virtually non-existent compared to what you do during the intermission. So boss doesn't exist while fear adds are up, just tunnel adds. When first add is around 20 to 30 percent, start moving towards second add, which is on star. Non-active tank can stay with green add if it needs another interrupt. Keep in mind that you do get wicked stars during this, so you can either move boss to the star marked add during these, and wicked star players just have to adapt, or you stay put with Anduin and raid moves to star mark and Anduin joins after the wicked stars. Lot of stars. And again, when the second add is around 20% move to the next add. Non-active tank, again, interrupt star if needed. Now when you're at the third add, a delicate timing starts, if you will, as you'll need to move Anduin on top of the fourth add when there's like five seconds-ish left on the King's Morn timer. Now to make this foolproof, set the fourth add CC doesn't break too early, have a druid cyclone it right before the tank drags it on top of it. So we maybe got the cyclone out when there is six, seven seconds left on the King's Morn timer, and then we just drag boss on top of it. This way you never accidentally break the CC, and team one will be in position to nuke the fourth add while waiting for the King's Morn slap to hit, just as the cyclone breaks. Just remember that this add will have sub one sec cast on its sphere, so it is extremely important that you follow up the cyclone with something like Hammer of Justice, Solar Beam, or Kidney Shot. Following this, team one goes down again, upstairs peeps finish fourth, fear add, move boss away from small adds. For this, there's no super important timing, just get team one out when they're done with all their adds. Usually around the time where you get the next barrier. So when team one gets out, deal with barrier, then stay put around circle mark for the second set of fear adds. This time we do circle green star and last purple. So full nuke on fear add, when there's like sub five seconds left on the King's Morn timer, move boss to the green marked add and slap King's Morn there. We used a hammer of justice on the green add here so we didn't need to interrupt during all of this. Now this overlap is actually very hectic and a lot of things can go around here and a few seconds following it. So as soon as team two goes down, you get stars while having to interrupt slash stun the fear add and AoE interrupting all these small adds, which is then followed by a barrier and hope breaker. So there's tons of raid damage, tons of movement, and due to this overlapping with stars, a lot of interrupters or stunners might be out running with stars. So have ample interrupt set up for the green marked fear add with backups and preferably backup AoE interrupts for the small adds as well. And this is really the last tricky part of the fight, so big focus on it. So again, we move boss away from small adds, left and right with stars, ignore barrier a bit, and as soon as team two is done, we finish small adds and then everyone stacks in the barrier to heal it away. Then we move on to third and finally fourth add. Just remember you have to finish the fourth add before the second intermission starts. You can start channeling the intermission thingy as you'll actually get the damage buff for a few seconds to help finish the fourth add, but if you go too long, the add heals and can't be interrupted. So yeah, kill it before intermission. And that's pretty much phase two. Biggest tip I can give here is focus on adds. Boss damage doesn't matter at all here. Like I said, the faster you kill fear adds, the easier this phase gets. Because everything that can go wrong in this phase pretty much has something to do with the fear adds. So when you start phase two, you can pretty much ignore Anduin. Heck, put him on the edge or wherever. Doesn't matter. Just focus on killing adds, managing interrupt stunts and silences. And once you're actually comfortable, with that, then you can start minimax cleaving the boss. Now, for the second intermission, nothing changes except you don't have bloodlust. But it plays out the same. Most players have CDs running for the first monster's soul, one two DPSers hold cooldowns or time their ramps so they can blast second monster's soul. But I really, really, really want to emphasize focusing on the monster's soul. This set of souls will be rougher, and it's pretty much 
the only thing you'll wipe on and trust me phase 3 is pretty much a joke so as long as you get there you have a very good chance of killing it the first time you get to phase 3. For us it took 3 tries, 1 we insta died cause everyone just panicked, 2nd we played very well just not well enough and 3rd it died. Now with that said let's break down phase 3. Now like I mentioned it's a bit of a joke, that being said though it does have very strict positioning and it's very easy to insta wipe if you aren't careful. So due to the fragments of hope that spawns whenever someone clears their debuff you want a set rotation of cleansers and soakers if you will. So let's go over that a bit. So we cleared and soaked in sets of 2 except the very first one where we did 3 clears. The dot that the raid gets when you clear is rough AF especially combined with his empowered hope breaker which is why we only did one triple clear. So when hopelessness goes out everyone spread out in these rough positions. We had 3 melee cleared their debuff first and then 2 tanks plus 1 melee dps soaked the fragments clearing their debuffs. It is very important that you move into the barrier to clear you do so in the direction you want the fragment to fly. So if you move like on the picture the fragment circles will spawn roughly as you can see here. Now as soon as they cleared they stack in melee to make space. Following that we cleared two at a time with two soakers nomming the fragments. So we had all spread positions, all clears, all soaks, all planned out beforehand so everyone had a spot to spread to. Everyone knew what direction to clear in and their soak buddy knew roughly where it's gonna land. So like you can see in this picture we have group 2, 3, 4, where they go in, where they soak. Now on top of this we also immune 4 of these hopelessness marks. So when hopelessness goes out we had 2 pre-assigned locations for these immuners to spread to. And when it goes off we had these players collide with immunities up. So for example our mage would ice block, hunter turtles and then moves into the ice blocked mage. Demon hunters, netherwalk and uh, just hug it out. Never too dark for a hug. So this is something you can do if you have some immunes to make this phase a bit easier. It's not something you have to do but I mean if you have them why not. Now as far as who you clear first is up for debate. Some guilds clear tanks and healers first, some melee and tanks like us. In the end it doesn't matter greatly. We thought it made everything easier by not having hopelessness on melee. I mean it's in the name. You don't need more hopeless melee. But clearing healers fast also makes a lot of sense so choose one stick with it. Now how does this play out in actuality? At the start of phase 3 pull boss back a bit to make space stack up on boss for the first empowered hope breaker cause this slaps. As soon as it's done move out to your hopeless position, immuners hug it out, triple clear like 2-3 seconds after the marks goes out don't just do it instantly, then just go 2 at a time. I recommend having someone call this out like healer or raid leader as the dot shreds you want it controlled. Now as soon as one group has cleared they need to move and make space, you'll soon need to stack on boss again so go there. Once you're done clearing all the marks stack on boss and blast away and that's pretty much all there is to phase 3. As long as you get through the first initial clears and soaks of the hopeless debuff you're pretty much in the clear. Now depending on your dps you may or may not get a second set of hopelessness. Now if this happens prio clearing melee and tank then healers. Now half of the raid may be dead or die during this second hopelessness but it is extremely fine if that does happen. This phase kinda gets easier the less players you have alive. As there is nothing that requires you to have everyone alive the dps check is very minor and as long as you have one tank alive and a few dps you can even extend well into the third hopelessness. So don't throw in the towel until everyone is dead. I mean if you have a blood dk tank alive they can solve half the face. Now if your blood dk dies and all you're left with is a sad old brewmaster, well let's just say I couldn't solo survive quite as long as a blood dk. And yeah that is pretty much it for Anduin. Again phase 3 is very straightforward as long as everyone understands how the clear soak part works. How to move into the barrier to get the fragments flying correctly where you soak them. So as you're closing in on phase 3 I recommend going through this part in detail with the raid so everyone is confident of what they need to do once they get there as it can legit die first time you get to phase 3. Lastly if you want some written info with tons of helpful tips for this 
fight, like raid plans, recourse, and movements, check out the Anduin doc that's linked in the descriptions below. Made by Emmerkai from Fable on Ragnaros and dear old Shamina from Turtles on Terran Mill. Extremely helpful for when you do your raid prep. Short to the point, perfect to share with your raid team. Long rant got long, but hopefully this covers any question marks you might have about Anduin on Mythic. Hit me up in the comments when you've defeated poor old Anduin. Now if you have any questions at all about this encounter, also hit me up in the comments or become a patron or Twitch sub and get access to the Stanky Discord where you can find Raid Week or as healing notes and a ton of awesome people to help you out with anything during progression. Don't forget the usual stuff, like, comment, subscribe and ring that notification bell, it really helps me out. I'm also streaming all of our progression on Twitch so make sure to check that out. And if you have any questions about your progress during Sepulcher of the First Ones, you can always hit me up on stream. Mostly on Thursdays and Sundays and I raid with a Swedish guild now so comms might be a bit swinglish. Thank you all for watching and I will see you next time.